Hello and welcome to the Price Academy Bite Size History Videos. This video is introducing Marie Lafarge, the woman who poisoned her husband. Marie Lafarge was a French woman who was convicted of murdering her husband by arsenic poisoning in 1840. Her case became notable because it was one of the first trials to be followed by the public daily newspaper reports. She was the first person convicted largely on direct forensic toxicological evidence. So why did she do it? Let's find out. Marie Lafarge was born in Paris in 1816. Her father was an artillery officer, but he died in a hunting accident when she was 12. Her mother died seven years later. At 18, Marie was adopted by her maternal aunt, who was married to the Secretary General of the Bank of France. Marie did not get along with her aunt as she felt the poor relative. She did attend an elite school and interacted with daughters of the aristocracy, who she saw marrying rich noblemen. Unfortunately, Marie's dowry was only 90,000 francs. While this was considerable, it was not that impressive considering her family status. As Marie remained unmarried by 23, one of her uncles took responsibility for finding her husband. He engaged the services of a marriage broker in secret, like this man here. They produced just one candidate that fit the bill. Charles Lafarge was a big course man of 28. His father was a justice of the peace. Charles, however, was bankrupt after he had attempted to convert the former monastery his father had bought into a foundry. He saw a marriage as the only way to pay his creditors, Charles employed the same marriage broker who had been hired to find a husband for Marie. Charles advertised himself as a wealthy iron master with property worth more than 200,000 francs and an annual income of 30,000. To hide the fact that a marriage broker was involved, Marie's uncle passed Charles off as a friend and arranged a chance meeting with Marie at the opera. Marie did not like Charles, finding him common and repulsive, but agreed to marry him based on his advertisement of being an owner of a wealthy estate. Four days after meeting, they married on the 10th of August 1859. They left Paris for Liglandia, as seen here, to live on the estate. When they arrived three days later, Marie was disillusioned. The house was in ruins. It was damp and it was rat infested. Her in-laws were peasants who disgusted her and she was faced not with the wealth she expected but with considerable debt. The first night she locked herself in her room and wrote a letter to her husband imploring him to reconsider the marriage and release her, threatening suicide by arsenic if he didn't. Lafarge, whose affairs were desperate, agreed not to exert his matrimonial privileges until the house was restored. Things calmed down for now. In December 1839, Charles left on a business trip to Paris. Beforehand, Marie made a will, bequeathing to her husband her entire inheritance, with the proviso that he would do the same to her. This he did, but soon after changed it without her knowledge. Whilst in Paris, Marie wrote Charles passionate love letters and sent him her picture, as well as a Christmas cake. He ate a piece of it and became violently ill. Thinking the cake had spoiled, he threw it away. When Charles returned to Liglandia, he still fell ill. Marie put him to bed and fed him venison and truffles. Charles worsened and the family doctor was called. Marie asked the doctor for a prescription of arsenic to kill the rats which disturbed her husband during the evening. The next day, Charles suffered from leg cramps, dehydration and nausea. The doctor diagnosed cholera and prescribed eggnog to strengthen him. One of Charles' cousins had been keeping an eye on him and she was called Anne O'Brien. She noticed Marie taking white powder from a box and stir it into the eggnog. When questioned, Marie said it was orange bottom sugar. But Anna's suspicions were aroused when she noticed white flakes floating on the surface of the eggnog after Charles took a few sips. She showed the glass to the doctor who tasted it and experienced a burning sensation. But he said it could have been a ceiling plaster that fell into the glass. Unconvinced, Anna put the rest of the eggnog away and kept an eye on Marie. She saw Marie stir more white powder into some soup for Charles. 
Again, Charles felt violently ill after a few sips. Anna took the soup away and told the family of her suspicions. On the 12th of Jan, 1840, the family were informed of the suspicions that Marie was poisoning Charles with arsenic. The gardener even admitted he had bought arsenic for Marie for the rats to make rat poison paste, which alleviated their fears temporarily. However, on the 13th of Jan, Charles passed away and the family decided to go to the police at Breve. The Justice of the Peace arrived on the 15th of Jan and took possession of the soup, the sugar water and eggnog that had been put aside. The gardener gave him the rat poison and the rat poison paste which was all over the house but weirdly had been untouched. The doctors performed an autopsy on Charles and examined his stomach and asserted that large quantities of arsenic were found in his body even though they couldn't be 100% sure. Surprisingly, the analysis of the rat poison paste revealed it to be nothing more than flour, water and soda. The small box where the white powder had been kept was also tested and found to contain arsenic. Marie was arrested and held in jail in Breve. Marie was put on trial for murder and arrived at court for the first time on the 3rd of September 1840, dressed in mourning and carrying a bottle of smelling salts. Chemists and toxicologists were hired by the prosecutors to exhume Charles' body and test it again for arsenic and also the food. Traces were found in his body and the coffin and also the eggnog and it was said that it contained enough poison to kill 10 people sentenced to life imprisonment with hard labour on the 19th of September. However, the king reduced the sentence to just life imprisonment. While in prison, she wrote her memoirs, published in 1841, and she was released by Napoleon III in June 1852 when she got TB. She died on November the 7th, 1852. Don't forget, if you enjoyed this video, to like and subscribe to my channel. You can follow me at Twitter at LittleMissHistory81, at TanyaAlex38 or at Facebook.com forward slash TanyaAlex38.